Good evening. My name is the Reverend Andrew Kerr. I'm the pastor teacher in Norbracken Reformed Presbyterian Church in Belfast. And it's my privilege to welcome you to our pre-recorded service which will be broadcast tomorrow morning. We're going to look in this service at Psalm 51. So before we read God's word, let's just begin with prayer. Now let us all pray. Our God in heaven, you're a God of glory, you're a God of holiness, you're a God of righteousness and you're a God of grace and merciful forgiveness. You're a God who has expressed your eternal kindness towards your people whom you came to save in the person of Jesus Christ our Redeemer. And we bless you and thank you, O God, for his death on the cross, whereby today we can draw near to you through his blood. We thank you that by his crucifixion and resurrection and exaltation to your right hand, through his completed saving work, we can approach you with boldness and confidence, for he has gone beyond the rent veil and he has entered into the holy heavenly places, the very throne of God, uh, where he presents and ever lives to make intercession uh, through his atoning work for his people. So we pray, O oh God, uh, mindful of your glory and your majesty and the height and beauty and the infinity of your perfections, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we ourselves, O oh God, have sinned and fallen short in many ways, in word, in thought and in deed. And so again, this morning, O oh God, we pray that you would wash us and cleanse us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that lamb without blemish, the unspotted one, the sinless substitute who was slain in your heart before the foundation of the world and whose salvation has been revealed and declared and proclaimed in the gospel in these last days for the sake of all who will believe and come to know and love and serve him. So we pray for all those in the congregation at Notbracken this morning. We pray, O oh Lord, you'd fill them with your peace and your joy and your grace at this time of coronavirus uh, crisis. We pray, O oh Lord, you'd grant us wisdom in this time of the pandemic. We pray we would walk humbly before you, our God, and love justice and seek mercy. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be a good witness within our homes, within our families, to our neighbours and friends by how we respond uh, to this difficulty which has come upon the world at this present time. May by our demeanour and our conduct uh, display, O oh God, a contentedness in all circumstances knowing that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. May we display, O oh God, a contentedness with your providence and your purposes, knowing that none of this has taken you by surprise. For the lonely, O oh God, we pray you would be their company and their comfort and consolation near by your spirit through your word. For the sorrowing, O oh God, we pray that you would wipe away all the tears from their eyes with the hand of Christ. For those who are fearful, O oh God, we pray you'd calm their hearts and that they would stand still and see the salvation of God. For those who are busy, O oh God, strengthen them for the task that they have to do. For the mothers, for the fathers, May you grant them patience with their children and wisdom as to how to live before them and to instruct them. For the children, O oh God, may you grant them the sweet and holy and reverent submission of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and may, O oh God, you build us up in our times of family worship in our homes. 
for the needy, O God, we pray you would supply all needs. For the elderly, O God, we pray that they would be uh, fat and full of sap and ripe of fruit in their old age. And for all your flock, O God, tend us, guide us, lead us and shepherd us. And this morning, bless us through the reading and the proclamation of your word. Draw us close to Christ in repentance and faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we're going to read then Psalm 51. Psalm 51, that wonderful psalm of David's confession of sin, uh, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband Uriah. Uh, this is the word of God. It's entitled to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Amen. And we know God blesses his word when read. In this decadent me first culture, people leap to take offence quickly. We're hurt by what someone said or wounded by what someone did. Psalm 54, uh, 51 verse 4, however, tilts our compass of offence in a different direction. David's plea of confession here shows what is meant by real repentance without which is no true forgiveness. So it's important we understand this, what real true godly sorrow and repentance is. The first thing we see is that God is offended. God is offended there was, of course, a lot of collateral damage in David's royal murder, deceit and adultery. And yet, David speaks here of God exclusively as the only soul injured party. He is the one who has been offended. The wounds of Bathsheba, Uriah and Israel, because it was the king who sinned, are nothing compared, David thinks, to offending the lawgiver himself. This, says Derek Kidner, is a typically biblical way of going to the heart of the matter. David realises the following things. His majesty has been attacked. His covenant is breached. His body is not his own, but 
as the scriptures say he has been bought with a price and in committing adultery he sinned against God. God's marriage ordinance given at creation male and female uh, husband and wife cleaving and leaving this covenant has been violated and when he killed Uriah by telling his cousin Job the general to withdraw the troops from the front line where the, the battle was fierce at the city wall and Uriah was placed deliberately in harm's way. Uh, his divine image was attacked and God's holiness was insulted. Jesse's son, he realises and knows full well, deserves a blast of provoked eternal infinite wrath for his sinned against the eternal and the infinite law giver who threatens judgment and punishment on sin. This is sobering, very sobering indeed that God is offended by his sin and our sin. This warns saints, of course, not to label others as sinners if God is not offended. This also frees saints from uh, taints that new morality concocts and would brand us guilty of the breach but when there are no real sins because God didn't say they're wrong. Uh, this also reminds us all that it's only in God's light that the true gravity and weight of the offence and the magnitude and enormity of sin is seen. You'll remember how Joseph put it when a Potiphar's wife tried to waylay him in Potiphar's house in Egypt. How could I do such a great thing? evil and sin against God. So we're not to write off lesser offences and sins like malice and gossip and anger and strife and pornography or adultery, false religion or Sabbath breaking simply as momentary lapses, personal defeats, a loss of reputation or face or a reason to blush or anything trivial like that. Legal breaches, we must always realise, offend divine glory. And tears have only value, therefore, when penitent, if wept in grief for offending a God who is holy. That's the first thing we see. God is offended. We have offended God and the true repentance of which the Bible speaks realises this, true repentance involves this sense that we've offended God primarily. The second thing we learn about this repentance is that sin is wicked. If God is offended, sin is wicked. David here entirely avoids any attempt to airbrush his guilt or whitewash over the cracks or sweep the dirt of his sin under the carpet. You'll remember how earlier he employed varied terminology, turning round and viewing sin like a very uh, black piece of coal from every angle. And now he attaches evil to his foul, perverse, polluting rebellion. He said he has sinned. David fell far short. He's saying, I, David, have missed God's mark. He also uses the perfect tense, which in the Hebrew almost always signifies a completed action when it's found by itself. That's the sense of the perfect tense. It's something completed. It's been done. It's finished. And there's no turning the clock back now or rewinding history. If only it could, but it couldn't. It's a completed act. 
and the particularity of sin as well as its completion and its falling short is stressed by the little word the sin the sin i wonder have you a particular stain in your life and you view it before god as the sin So Adam's sin was catastrophic for the whole race and yet David knows that in light of God's majesty and presence and the wickedness of his own heart and actions which he now can't reverse, his sin was heinous. His adultery made him loathsome. In murder he slew God's likeness and image. It was a direct assault on God himself and he cloaked his evil in lies before a God of truth. How contradictory for a man after God's own heart. And so we learn through this experience and confession of David that when sin is brought to light it betrays its ugly face. We need to stop comparing sin with sinners and bring its mud before our maker. Only then will we unmask it and see it for what it really is. Something to be loathed and abhorred, recoiled from as repugnant and to be parted from. The last thing we need to do with our sin is excuse it, dilute it, conceal it or tolerate it. Because without a holy revulsion, we'll never give up our sin, nor will we set a guard against our heart to prevent the approach and the advance and the progress of sin as temptation comes. I think it's John Owen says, unless we see God as the offended one, we'll never stop our sin. And so uh, this is true also. Unless we see the evilness of sin, we'll not take the deliberate step by God's grace with his spirit working in cooperation with us by, uh, as we progress in discipleship to consecrate ourselves to him again and again and again as we receive his mercy and forgiveness. But there is one more step to take towards genuine repentance which David stresses and this is the way to avoid superficial solutions to sin which stop short of breaking with sin which for the unbeliever uh, and those considering Christ causes them to miss salvation or for believers who have come to Christ to deceive themselves with respect to their sanctification. So we want to avoid all those superficial sticking plasters that let sin fester and grow and linger. So the final thing we see is not only is God offended, not only is sin wicked, but thirdly and finally, guilt is damned. Guilt is damned. False repentance, as I've said, never leaps this final hurdle. God convicts us of guilt and shows us our sin to be grave and serious and enormous. So we will vindicate him and his verdict as God and judge is just and righteous and holy and good. This language of justification here refers to courtroom acquittal. David is clearing his judge. He's saying God's law and its sentence of condemnation of death is right and good his divine sanction against sinners is just his penalty is thoroughly well deserved and earned for he's seen sin now for what it is an offense in god's nostrils and a foul thing to be 
reviled and revolt that. He recognizes that God is right to banish man from God's pleasure park of paradise. That it would be right and just for God to cast him as king of God's church out of the church to remove him and exclude him and banish him from the fellowship of the saints. That death is what he deserves and hell's torment everlastingly would be fair. Well, like the dying thief, this man has done nothing wrong, but we are punished justly. Our curse, our crucifixion as criminals and thieves hung up between heaven and earth before God is just and righteous and holy and good. And of course, then he turned to his substitute. And it was this wrath, of course, that made Jesus halt before consenting willingly, gladly and submitting to drain it to its dregs, this cup. And so we see how that dumbing down of sin dilutes Christ's sin bearing work and is an affront to the gospel, actually. Steve Chalk in the Oasis Trust reject, it seems, the Father's wrath. We call it some kind of cosmic child abuse or words to that effect. Uh, we see that when so-called evangelicals doubt whether hell exists, they're, they, they're far from the mark. We see that liberal spins on Calvary omit all talk of divine holiness. They're so far from the truth. A God of love could never express the heat and fury of his wrath. What kind of creator, they say, consigns his own handiwork to hell? You see, all of these false and erroneous charges uh, against those who preach the true gospel, the biblical gospel, the gospel of the Old and New Testaments, fulfilled and declared in the apostolic testimony, all these Christ assaults deny that sin is a damnable offence. That sin's seriousness is somehow less. That we don't as sinners deserve all that the Bible says that we do deserve and have earned. That the wages of sin is not death. That our crimes are only lapses. That our tears, well, that will rinse away all mistakes or maybe some good charitable works will clean the matter up with God. In spite of no moral change and an inbuilt hostility to God that remains. But Christ's nails do proclaim justice in truth. The cross does depict graphically God's holy love that I deserve that hell and because he stood in our place he took our hell and that the father did not spare his son but gave him up freely for us all in this God world love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's the wrath that brings a death to God's love. Listen to David's words again. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're justified when you speak and pure in your judgment or verdict. Do you repent like that? Do you see your ill deserts? That the deepest, darkest pit is your rightful place personally for your own sin, which you can't undo yourself. Do liberal errors and lies trouble and offend you? 
these God deniers, these cross decriers, these spirit insulters. Well, if God has granted this godly grace of repentance, be sure to exercise it on a daily deepening basis as you come on your knees and cry for mercy. Holy Spirit, I have grieved you. Lord Jesus Christ, I have committed terrible sin which you have borne in my place and suffered the punishment for its guilt. Heavenly Father, I do deserve wrath, but I'm amazed at your love and I marvel at your grace and kindness that you would send your only son and not spare him for my sin. Well, if we come like this in true repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ, we will know relief of pardon, which is a certain joyful outcome because when we go down to the depths, we will be enabled by the reverse of the gospel, by the acquittal of sin, by the God who freely justifies, we'll be enabled to scale the heights. The Catechism says in closing in question 87, well, what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavour after new obedience. Will you hate your sin, turn from it to God, and by the mercy of God in Christ, endeavour to live a new life? May God more and more grant us this grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you, lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace.